kind of like a paradise here, isn't it? That we were all away from the world and center our thoughts on spiritual matters and be fairly benign. And the, the committee has organized this beautiful devotional meeting this morning. Sometimes we go in the whole devotional meeting is uh, heavy beat, you know, the singing the singing prayers of bang, 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 and the drums and everything, aren't they? Uh, some people like that. I'm not particularly attracted to that. And you sometimes just say, could someone also just read a prayer? And we had it beautiful this morning. We had a mix, and we didn't have any heavy beats. And I think that's so perfect. And I liked that also in New Zealand last year. Yeah, amazing. North Island Summer School, 900 people. 200 children. About a quarter of the people were islanders and Maoris, so there was this terrific mix of all kinds of children. We talked about the same subject. I don't know if that's made a difference or not, but every time I talk about it, it makes a difference to me. Now, we had this ministers of the House of Justice or something. I, they asked me, how do you want to be introduced? I said, as a former everything, a former, former, former. Former and failing, I told them. But they said, no, I can't say that. <laughs> you know, friends, but in the faith, uh, we really have to see with our own eyes and not with the eyes of others. We have to know for ourselves. So everything you hear from anybody, literally anybody, not institutions, but I mean just anybody, and that includes individual house members, hands of the cause, you have to sort it in your mind. Is this in accordance with what I have I've seen in the teachings? Because we're all powerful and imperfect. But we, we go around and we remind each other of what the teachings say. But ultimately, you're, you're the, the sorting house. And if you hear something say, well, I've never seen that in the teachings. Well, maybe you've never read it. But maybe it isn't there also. So you have to figure that out. If you have it in a way station, and then finally you read it in the right and say, oh, oh this, that is authentic. Misrepresentative, or whatever it is. Then you move it over to the solid knowledge. So just bear that in mind. You know? Be a little forgiving if I say things that are beyond the pale. I was telling somebody yesterday, it's a, it's a little more elegant and sophisticated now than it was in the time of Muhammad. He got to the point where he looked at the people who were opposing him and he said, do you think this is a joke? Am I trifling? Do you think this is trifling with you? God has made you. He's made me and he's given me a message to give you. If you accept that message and obey because he's the owner of everything, possessor of creation, you will be blessed and you will have heavenly life in the life to come. And if you reject it and you don't do that, you're going to burn in hell. Straightforward like that. You know? And I mean, that's really the basic line. It's a little heavy. You don't like to hear that now. Oh, we don't believe in hell. We don't believe in a physical hell as well. The fireside teaching is we don't believe in hell. I don't think so. You better look in the writings and check that out. If you're going to live in a world basically of your own imaginations, sounds like hell to me. I don't know. I mean, you know how some of your nightmares are. You want to live in that realm forever? So he says we're offering you a way out. Teachings of God will change you into a new being, give you new sight, new vision, and you can go on with your life some tranquility. How many of the people in the world are drugged because they're depressed? <coughs> Even children now in the States, so many children being given all kinds of except the hyperactive ones. Interesting enough, in, in, in this place in um, New England where the kids come, they're super active, they give them a heavy shot of coffee, it calms them down. Has the, has the opposite effect on them. That's interesting. So if you're hyperactive, have some coffee. <laughs> After you read the hidden words. <laughs> all right, friends, where does all this come from? The last uh, decade of the Guardian's life, of course, five years of it were the first half of the World Crusade, which he prepared the world for and launched all the five communities. And uh, he would summarize his thoughts for the pilgrims often. And in this case, these are a series of letters written to his secretary. 
how can we be effective in our teaching work? Is that a question that concerns you? I mean, we all are trying to do the teaching work, but it would be nice if it could be effective and useful rather than just busy work. It stresses this, it explains it. I'm going to read a few of these and you'll see they overlap each other, but they also spread the vision of, the, of what, we're, what we're talking about here and then we go into the individual steps. He writes, this just uh, about a year before he passed away. Success will crown the efforts of the friends on the home front when they meditate on the teachings, pray fervently for divine confirmations for their work, study the teachings so that they may carry their spirit to the seeker, and then act and above all, persevere in action. When these steps are followed and the teaching work carried on sacrificially and with devoted enthusiasm, the faith will spread rapidly. We have the promise of God's sign of God on earth. Do this and it'll be okay. Again, he says, the keynote of success in the teaching field is to study the word, prayer, meditation, and then action. Above all, perseverance in action. When these steps are followed in the realm of self-sacrifice, success will be achieved. So we have elements with regard to praying and meditating and studying and then acting. And with respect to acting, we have perseverance to persevere and sacrifice. Simple but very broad oceans of action that we have ahead of us. So and another one, again, same, same theme, if you just slightly different form. It says, study of the word meditation on its divine import, prayer, and then action are necessary, and then perseverance in action. If these steps are followed, one will develop spiritually and be victorious in service to the cause of God. Beyond writing this to various individuals, a letter was addressed from him to the hands of the cause serving in the United States at that time where he elaborates a bit more on the theme. <coughs> the beloved guardian has stressed over and over again that to effectively teach the faith, the individual must study deeply the divine word, imbibe its life-giving waters, and feast upon its glorious teachings. He should then meditate on the import of the word and finding its spiritual depths Pray for guidance and assistance. But most important, after prayer, is action. After one has prayed and meditated, he must arise, relying fully on the guidance and confirmation of Baha'u'llah to teach his faith. <coughs> Perseverance in action is essential, just as wisdom and audacity are necessary for effective teaching. Okay, that's another two elements here, wisdom and audacity, along with perseverance and sacrifice, wisdom and audacity. The individual must sacrifice all things to this great goal, and then the victories will be won. It's really giving us a complete formula, you know? You want to be successful, you want the cause to grow. These, these are essential steps. You can't go around them. I'm so busy in action that I don't have time to study, meditate, and pray. No, I don't think that's, that doesn't work. You're busy, yes, all the time, but is it having any effect? Is it having enough effect? Is it having the effect that you and your heart would like to see it have? So a lot of investment it goes into the study of the writing. I was mentioning last night about it. Every day we have the laws of the Kitab Yaktas, essential parts to recite the verses morning and evening. But besides that, there's this passage about immersing ourselves in the ocean of the teachings. Then we have Abu Baha's own encouragement about how much we must study the writings. There's so much to study, they're kind of, it's kind of overwhelmed. When we get to the section on study, there's certain books that Shoghi Sanya says are the first ones we should be concentrating on, particularly the Yugan and some answered questions. He said we should master all the details of those two books to be able to teach correctly and effectively. 
Um, this one, August 57, remember Shoghi Pendi passed away in November of 57, it was in August of 57, is the source of divine confirmation. This is a magnet that attracts blessings to us. Teaching is the source of divine confirmation. It's not sufficient to pray diligently for guidance, but this prayer must be followed by meditation as to the best methods of action, and then action itself. Even if the action should not immediately produce results, or perhaps not be entirely correct, that does not make so much difference. Because prayers can only be answered through action. And if someone's action is wrong, God can use that method of showing the pathway which is right. I remember when I was a new Baha'i, the Baha'i said, you know, if you're sitting in your car with the engine turned off and you pray for guidance, how are you going to get guided? You've got to turn the engine on and start moving. And then your prayer, you can be guided. So even if we're doing the wrong thing, he says, if you're in motion, God can correct that. Course correction fixes it. And the more you continually study and meditate, you find what, where the corrections may be. He, he, it opens him to be able to, to guide us. So we don't want to pray with the engine turned off. The other thing the guardian used to say to the pilgrims is that the cause progresses by sacrifice. Sacrifice is the fuel in the engine of the cause. Sacrifice makes it go forward. Doing everything we're able doesn't make it go forward. It maintains it, but it doesn't go forward. Sacrifice means doing something we think is beyond what we're able to do. Pushing ourselves when we don't have the, the time and the money and the, you know, the, the areas of, of sacrifice, Shoghi Effendi said, are I hope I can remember them. There's three of them. Let's see. The first one, he says, he, is a sacrifice of our material means. We sacrifice to the fun. The second one is we sacrifice uh, our time. Think of how you divide your time. How much time is available to serve the cause and to do these things we're talking about. Really? We have to sacrifice some other things, make more time to be able to do this in our lives. And they, there are stages when it's very difficult, a child raising stage, and because there's no let up of the demands that we have from our circumstances around us. We have to try to do this, try to find this. So we have sacrifice of money, and we have sacrifice of time. And then he says the third one, this is the difficult one, sacrifice of self. Sacrifice of the goals we have in life, our own personal goals. We'd like to do this, we'd like to attain to this, maybe in our education, all different things. We're sacrificing all kinds of things that look like we're losing, you know, the traction that we have for the things we want to accomplish in life. That's a that's difficult. That's, that that hurts, hurts. So finances, time, and self, personal goals, all of these, in the end, they all, if, if you do those things, of course, you attain the, the goal that God has for you which is the right goal anyway, it's better than your own life plan and ambitions or whatever it might be. It takes a lot of thinking about along the way. This persevere in action, you don't always see success at the beginning. Some of the success is very hard one. People who went to like the Orkney Islands or Falkland Islands struggled for years to get one Baha'i. And that one Baha'i was a terrific victory in a place that was so solidly set against what the cause stands for. Bill Sears, you know, he was the end of the cause, he was, he was a very wonderful humorist at the same time. And uh, in the crusade, when these letters were coming out, he made a little drawing through, <coughs> had a friend do a little drawing of a, an island which was about two meters wide with a palm tree on it, and there's this older pioneer couple there, all in rags. They pulled a bottle out of the sea, and they've taken a notice out of the bottle. They're reading the notice, and it says, Persevere, show me. He <laughs> <laughs> said, so the guardian had a chuckle himself when he saw, saw, saw this thing. <laughs> that's sometimes how it felt, it just pushing against all odds. There's a thing, uh, the master, I saw something in the talk of the master, he said also, he said, that if we're sincere, God can even use our mistakes for the service of the cause. 
Well, that's very consoling, really. You know, it is, uh, of all the things we do that we don't do right, at least we're trying to do the good thing, and whatever it is, he can bless that. He can make it have an effect. Finally, in relation to this letter from a bit earlier, which you may have seen, it was in a compilation called Living the Life that came out at the end of the crusade years ago. Listen to the circumstances of this. Very interesting. He says, when a person becomes a Baha'i, actually what takes place is that the seed of the spirit starts to grow in the human soul. Becoming a Baha'i, the seed of the spirit inside the soul sprouts. This seed, he goes on, must be watered by the outpourings of the Holy Spirit. The, these gifts of the Spirit are received through prayer, meditation, study of the holy utterances, and service to the cause of God. Same, same for there as to be effective in the teaching work, he says this is what makes the soul grow. It comes from the Holy Spirit, and those three actions, four actions that are mentioned in these four steps, are also the things that bring all of us as Baha'is into a greater understanding of what we need to be doing in life. He says, you know, that the more we study, the more we understand that our previous notions were erroneous. Every time we read, if it broadens our vision, we say, wow, I had a really limited view of this, you know. By community, the Baha'i life, and by community, it's very nice, I like it, the people are so nice, and I like being with them. And I say that little prayer every day at noon, too. And yes, it's wonderful. It's good, but that's not the vision of the kingdom of God and the descent of the divine commonwealth into this realm and the transformation of people's personal selfish wills into the will of God, into the vision of the kingdom in this world as well as in the world to come that the Christians have been praying for for centuries. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we have this terrific outpouring. Six million words we have recorded digitally of the, of the writings of Baha'u'llah in the Holy Land. Five million of the Ba'a. Five million is greater than the combined revelations of all the known prophets that we have in history. And then he doubles that by his own revelation. And then Baha'u'llah goes even further than that. Now, nobody's read them all. We've digitized them all, but it's just an overwhelming task. But the themes, they're digitized and they're organized by theme. It means the House of Justice can ask, let's see everything Baha'u'llah revealed about justice. And if you can outline that into a presentation form that will help us, we study, we'll study that. And any subject that you have, you could find there in the writings, if it's there. It's, and anything he hasn't pronounced on, then the House of Justice has the possibility of defining that for us. But it's not part of Revelation. And they can change their instructions and views. Again, Abu Baha says, because their words do not constitute part of the Revelation. It's supplementary. Now, one of the concerns of Baha'i is at the time that the Guardian passed away and there was no successor, was the teaching say that the Guardian will define the sphere of legislation of the House of Justice. In other words, you need the guardian there to say, well, this is a subject you can act on or not act on. But in the same dispensation of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Fendi states, which is a great consolation, he said, the guardianship and the House of Justice have their specific spheres and activities that they have to carry out. He said, neither will stray from their divine. Reinforcing that even more, are some thousand references in the writings of Shoghi Effendi that says this is a matter for the decision of the House of Justice. So it defines whole areas of possibility that the House can, can deal with. And then it's the source of all good and free from error. So we can trust that. So we have this uh, complementary, the revelation which defines things as they are from the from the divine point of view, and then we have the House of Justice able to, able to supplement that and adjust the actions of the Baha'i community and different aspects of our lives 
according to the progress that humanity makes. So this allows the faith to be adjusted to the time, any particular time, through the vision of the House of Justice. This is a terrific addition to the past, you know. So if any said, Moses brought laws, Christ brought teachings, Muhammad brought laws and teachings, Baha'u'llah brings laws, teachings, and institutions. The form of the religions of the past adopted forms from the society around them, and that led to a certain dilution, if you will, of the accuracy and beauty of the institutional way. But here we have been given a body that matches perfectly the spirit of the faith. We've been given the form in the administrative order through which the spirit of Baha'u'llah operates in society and through, that, through those institutions in our own lives. Walk up the four steps engraved on your head now, I hope. Even the order shifts a little in these, but basically it's prayer, prayer meditation, meditation, study, and action. 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 And what about the action? Persevere in action. Yeah. And what else about action? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Character of the action. Or you know, we go on now with some dimensions about prayer. Do you have anything you wanted to ask about those first? This is a very suggestive passage that the spirit starts growing within the soul when we recognize the manifestation of God. Then it needs steady interaction with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes through prayer, meditation, study, and service and action. In the compilation on obligatory prayers and fasting, we have, we have Baha'u'llah saying that of all deeds, the most acceptable deed in the sight of God is the recitation of obligatory prayer. Now, in the West, we kind of think of deeds as something you have to be doing for somebody else, like helping the old lady across the street, or you know, the kind of traditional idea of what it means to. But here's Baha'u'llah is turning them on its head. He says, first you want to please God. And what pleases God most is that you say the obligatory prayers, you firm in your use of obligatory prayers. This is a stress in many different places. Abdu'l-Bah, in one tablet, he says there are two legitimate excuses for missing and not saying obligatory prayer. One is that you're too sick to get out of bed. And he says the other thing is that you're mentally deranged in saying that you can't figure it out. So basically, if we miss one of our prayers, we have to see which one of those excuses applies. And it ends up that there's no excuse. And we really want to take a hold of it. Nobody can tell us, nobody can ask us to report on whether we're saying the obligatory prayer or not. This is the foundation of everything. And you know, Abba Ba'a says another tablet, he says, the use of the obligatory prayers protects you from severe tests. And the nature of the prayers is such that it transcends other prayers. We have occasional prayers, but we have these, like the tablet of Ahmad, the obligatory prayers, some healing prayer, although we don't know which of the healing prayers. He says the healing prayer, but we've got three healing prayers that look like they could fit that category of being extra powerful. Of course, the long one, but the short obligatory, the short healing prayer is also very, we don't have a problem, we can use both. If you don't know which obligatory prayer to say, say all three of them. <laughs> no, he doesn't say you must choose one. He says you may choose one of the three, and that would be sufficient. But I think there are moments and times in our life when really we could consider saying the three of them. The long prayer, what does it take? Twelve minutes to say. Twelve minutes out of 24 hours. Wow, that's a time. Effort. The other, in the morning, you know, in one of the tablets, Abdul Baha describes written to Ishkabal, he said, the friends arise at the earliest dawn of day, you proceed to the Mashakal Askar, go to the fountains and do the ablutions, and then they go in the temple, and then they hear the chanting and recitation of prayers and the tablets until the spirit is exalted, it's raised up. And at that moment, they said the, the service, there's a pause, and each one for himself says the obligatory prayer, which in that case is the three, the one you say three times a day. You're in the presence of everybody else, but you're saying it. 
It's a private prayer, but it's not a secret prayer. You know, the Persians know this because they were in families where they saw their parents doing the obligatory prayers and saying the greatest thing. But our, our Western approach has been more Christian in the sense that nobody should know when we're praying. But it's all right. It's an example to others. It's okay. Don't show off. But don't miss it because you can't be alone. And when you go out in the tribal areas, people, whole families are living in one hut. How do they? You can go out in the rain to say they're a good tribe or go stand in the hot, tropical sun. I don't know. It's difficult. These things have to be worked out. That's why <coughs> Shogi Finney said there were martial arts cars in every village, town, and city of the world. Movement to draw the confirmations of God and then go out and serve humanity. These are auxiliary institutions around the house of worship. Simple suggestion of the guardian. He says, the guardian wishes you therefore to pray and to supplicate the Almighty that he may give you a fuller measure of his grace, that through it your spiritual energies may be quickened and that you may become imbued with that spirit which must needs animate and strengthen every sincere and true follower of the faith. What are we praying for? He's also indicating here what we should be praying for. A fuller measure of his grace. And that our spiritual energies might be quickened. It doesn't happen all at once. It's gradual. It's like a baby born has to be fed. It's experience. It takes on the nutrition of the holy words and of the prayers and of the meditations. It grows in strength. When we come to the faith, we're first we're attracted with faith. Those of us that have become Baha'is outside of being born into a Baha'i family, but also the ones that have been born in a Baha'i family have to come to grips with becoming Baha'is on their own grounds sometime in their life, not being just Baha'is all day, they're just the children of Baha'i. It's my parents' faith, my grandfather's faith, but it's my faith. So we're attracted at first. And then Shodhi Kenny says we're confirmed. At a certain point we become confirmed, and that is we accept. We say, I believe this. This is, this is true. This strikes me as truth. But he says that's still a passive position. We get from there to the third stage, which he says is consecration, where that new person has been attracted, confirmed, begins to stand on their own feet. And the signs of that are that they you don't have to drive them to the feast necessarily. They seek out knowledge of the faith. They say their prayers by themselves without being reminded. They give to the Baha'i fund. That's a very important sign of spiritual maturity. And we're talking about the amount. It must supposed to be sacrificial in any case. But those are the signs. They take part in the teaching activities. They offer themselves in service. Attraction, confirmation, consecration. We want to move people through that. They don't generally move along that trajectory by themselves. They need Baha'i parents, Baha'i tutors, mentors to help them along. Even in the mass teaching, we would find the ones that would survive out of the mass teaching are the ones that had a little closer friendship with the teachers and heard more and got nurtured until their strength grew. If you leave a baby's just born and you drop it on the ground, it's not going anywhere. Very challenging. Shodhi Fendi told us consolidation must accompany expansion. Expansion and consolidation must go hand in hand. We kind of forgot that when we brought millions into the faith, hundreds of thousands of believers. A small band of teachers would go and bring a whole village into the faith in India, and then 20 years passed, nobody visited that village. And nothing happened. The house saw this in the 90s. And that's when he took steps to start establishing the institute process, which wasn't the Ruhi at the beginning, it was just the concept. The concept is there. There has to be an institute process. I think that's going to go on forever, but the content of it will be exactly the same. After a while, we found most national assemblies weren't doing anything about that. But the Ruhi system was working in a number of countries, so the House recommended it as, here's something that's been proven to be useful, adopted in your country. And then it became more universally citizen. Why is this? Because our local activities should take on certain core activities that would give character to our local Baha'i communities. Past, I think I mentioned this last night, we were centered on firesides and 19 day feasts. In the fireside, people would say, Do you have either other activities to go to? Well, we have a feast. That's secret. You can't come to that. 
is not a very nice way to treat the context. No? But now we have devotional meetings. Yes, we have devotional. Come to the devotional meetings. If you have children, we have children's classes. Everybody is welcome. You don't have to be a Baha'i to be in children's class. We have junior youth activities. Again, nobody was thinking about junior youth at that time. And then we have the institute process, which has aspects of deepening, but mainly it was training for action. Training for acts of service is the emphasis that's in the institute process material that we're, being, we're using now. And some of the old Baha'is say, oh, I know all these things. I've read this. I've read the teachings. Yes, okay. If you want to do the ruling courses so that you'll know what the new people are experiencing. So you have some idea of what the action of the cause at its heart is all over the world. So you go anywhere and you can be a tutor and you can help with it. Also, you can give classes on teaching, participate in study classes of the writings of the faith. That was never removed. There were agencies and offices of the faith, for some reason, were saying no firesides and no study classes. The house never said that. People would write the house, did you say this? The house would say, no, we never said that. How can you say it? It's against Baha'u'llah, law. It's against that the law. It's against Shoghi Effendi to say such a thing. But somehow it got fixed in our minds. When I was in Haifa in September now, one of the house members said, the house is very interesting that, the, that this older way of doing things and the newer one, they come together now. We go forward as we do it. Not only youth can teach the faith, adults can teach the faith. But it's always been that way. Nobody ever said it wasn't. But there was a stress and an encouragement to the youth because they weren't teaching the faith. And they weren't active in anything. And they were straying from the path. So the house instituted these terrific conferences for youth and has been encouraging the youth. And sometimes we're told that adults, well, you're good for driving the youth around and feeding them and housing them. Those are all good things, that's all right. But our individual teaching is coming from Baha'u'llah, the command to center your energies in the propagation of the cause of God. And that wouldn't matter so much if we thought the world was kind of getting along all right by itself, but it's going down the tubes. It's chaotic everywhere. So the responsibility of the lives to, to act on the basis of teachings is very, very intense. Another thing the guardian told the pilgrims, he said that the concourse on high, the confirmations of God, are not being drawn on sufficiently and they're under pressure in the, in the higher world, looking for avenues. To, so he says, anybody opens their mouth, suddenly they're blessed with divine confirmations and stuff. We want to be able to draw, draw. This is from the talk of Abdul Baha to Laura Barney, you know, who compiled the hidden words. I mean, compiled the... Uh, some answer question. Some answer question. He says, when we pray to God, a feeling fills our hearts. This is the language of the Spirit who speaks to God. When in prayer we are free from all outward things and turn to God, then it is as if in our hearts we've heard the voice of God. Without words we speak, we communicate, we converse with God and hear the answer. We must strive to attain to that condition by being separated from all things and from the people of the world and by turning to God alone. It will take some effort on the part of man to attain to that condition, but he must work for it. We can attain it by thinking and caring less for material things and more for the spiritual. The further we go from the one, the nearer we are to the earth, to the other. So we've got, you know, worldly affairs, materialistic existence here. As we rise towards spiritual goals, then we move up that, we're moving away from that. We're moving closer to one, but we're moving away from a more materialistic outlook. I mean, is that the more spiritual point of view in our action? Our spiritual perception, our inward sight must be opened. We can see the signs and traces of God's Spirit in everything. Everything can reflect to us the light of the Spirit. Now obviously this is another kind of vision. Maybe you say we don't see everything reflecting the signs of the Spirit. We want, to, we want to see how we can quicken our vision so that another atmosphere fills our souls. Another way of interpreting what we see around us. Another way of reacting to things. Will ye not behold the signs of God in the universe and in your own selves? Question that Muhammad places in the Quran. And Baha'u'llah quotes it many places in the writings. To see the signs of God in the universe and in your own selves. Some simple thing like 
how do you get saliva in your mouth? One of the signs of God. He's constantly making your blood coarse, he's making saliva calm, he gives you some tears, he gives you reasons for tears sometimes. Universe. Now science has opened the vision of the vastness of the universe. It goes on forever and ever. Galaxies, galaxies after galaxies, billions of stars, all of them with planets, every one of them with creatures, one stage or another. I mean, obviously, there's times when the planet is developing and it has creatures and the planet it dies. So yes, the world has a beginning. The world in the sense that the Earth has a beginning and an end, but the universe has no beginning and end. As far as I can see in the writings, Paul says this over and over. He describes processes, but they're not so much processes in time as they are prophecies, prophecies in hierarchy. Through the primal will, all-encompassing primal will, through the spirit of the manifestation which surrounds all of us, we're all cells in the body of the manifestation, his spiritual consciousness. We're all fish in the ocean of his divine presence. Some of the fish, he says, they don't recognize the water. It's just so much a part of life that it doesn't occur to them there's water that sustains them. All things live, move, and have their being through the manifestation of God. All things, minerals, vegetables, animals, Everything is dependent on the spirit of the manifestation. That's a quote from the God. Several places he says, everything lives and moves. You live and move. Your power of thought is not a material consequence of your brain reacting. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit out of us. If the spirit of the manifestation of God did not encompass and nurture us and provide for us, we wouldn't have any thinking process. Sometimes we get that screwed up with this resolved in the next world. At the beginning when we recite the prayers, maybe we don't always feel the same way. Sometimes we feel attracted, maybe some other times it's, we do it because of obedience and trying to conform to the, what the teachings say. You remember the passage that's cited in, usually in the front of the prayer book about the tone, O my servant, the verses of God that have been revealed, been received by thee, as intoned by them who have drawn nigh unto him that the sweetness of thy melody may kindle thine own soul and attract the hearts of all men. Whoso reciteth in the privacy of his chamber the verses revealed by God, the scattering angels of the Almighty shall scatter abroad the fragrance of the words uttered by his mouth, and cause shall cause the heart of every righteous man to throb, though he may at first remain unaware of its effect, even the person reciting it doesn't feel that. Yet the virtue of the grace vouchsafed unto him must need sooner or later exercise its influence upon his soul. Thus have the mysteries of the revelation of God been decreed by virtue of the will of him who is the source of power and wisdom. Now your prayers are having an effect. They go out. We don't know how far they influence the infusion of the grace of God through the recitation Repetition of those words in our own hearts, what, how it affects our neighbors and beyond that. We don't, we don't know exactly, we can't measure it. But he says, eventually it's going to have its effect on you. You may not be aware of it, mysterious as it, as it is the process. Then Shaggy Effendi in a letter, he says, you should rest assured that your strict adherence to the laws and observances enjoined by the Allah is the one power that can effectively guide and enable you to overcome the tests and trials of your life and help you to continually grow and develop spiritually. The cause of that? Strict adherence to the laws and observances enjoined by the Hala is the one power that can effectively guide and enable you to overcome the tests and trials of your life. We have tests and trials, we want to overcome them. Bring our lives into conformity with the divine teaching is the call he's making to us. Okay? The youth used to ask about that, you know, but aren't we supposed to have moderation? Is moderation somewhere between the standard of the world and the way the world is going right now with all of its perversities and everything? And the standard of Baha'u'llah, should we fix ourselves in the middle somewhere? You know, the law of Baha'u'llah is very difficult, but I don't know. <laughs> People say. So I said, well, I don't know, but in the New Testament, this in-between position is equated with lukewarmness. You're neither hot nor cold. Cold 
completely the way the world, hot, full on with the revelation. In the middle is lukewarm. And he says, the Lord will spew the lukewarm from his mouth. That doesn't sound like a very pleasant activity. So, so I say this moderation is what Paul says. Please don't do more than he says. You know, just <laughs> aim at doing what he says. That would be moderate. You might be fanatic if you overdid it. I don't know too many people in that position in the world that are doing more than strict adherence to them. Again, he promises, he says, the power of God can entirely transmute our characters and make us of us beings entirely unlike our previous selves. Just in case you don't like yourself very much, here's an opportunity for a change of self. New identity. Then he says, through prayer and supplication, obedience to the divine laws, Baha'u'llah is revealed, and ever-increasing service to his faith, we can change ourselves. I would say, show of hands, how many of you would like to change yourself? I know I could raise my hand, but I don't want to, I don't want to make you raise your hand. I don't want the one that says my arm doesn't work. <laughs> I'm trying, but that's too much for me. We kind of, you know, we kind of, dilute the thing for ourselves. We say, well, nobody can live that way. At least nobody that I know. Well, so, the standard of behavior for us is not what the rest of the Baha'is do. We shouldn't look around and say, oh, I go, I'm more active, I give more money, I'm, you know, a better teacher, whatever. The comparison is what? With the example of Agobah. If he's your comparison figure, you're never going to run out of the other goals ahead of you. It's very useful to have that example from keeps us humble, keeps us unfulfilled, so to speak. Once again, he says, am I using up all your time here? No. Although you seem to feel that your prayers have not so far been answered and do no longer have any hope that your material conditions will ameliorate. Sounds like a lot of our lives, doesn't it? Right? We've been wanting better lives. We think of it in material terms, too. doesn't happen. So what does the guardian say? The guardian wishes you, nevertheless, not to allow such disappointments to undermine your faith in the power of prayer, but rather to continue entreating the Almighty to enable you to discover the great wisdom which may be hidden behind all these sufferings. For are not our sufferings often blessings in disguise through which God wishes to test the sincerity and depth of our faith and thereby make us firmer in his cause? Remember in the hidden words he's talked about how calamity is God's providence. How are these fire and vengeance? They think, oh my God, what have I done? Why is this all happening to me? And then he says, but inwardly it's light and mercy. Nothing goes with us to the next world except that light of God that He's placed in our hearts. And after Paul says, it will be observed whether you have made that light brighter or you have dulled it. The only thing that's important getting to the next world, and after Paul says in the tablet which makes it difficult to live in this world, he says, the more tests and trials you have, the more that light increases. The best thing for the outcome to go to the next world is that you've been surrounded by hurricanes and winds of tests and disasters, devastating, or like a, a ship on the sea. You've withstood mountains, mountainous waves crashing down on the boat continually. That reminds me of something the Master said. He said, nobody becomes a competent captain on calm seas. Our lives are made of this difficulties. And we think there can't be a worse one coming than what I've already had, but somehow God thinks of new ones for us, helps us. Now, we say this is a disaster and God doesn't ask, doesn't answer my prayers. He answers our prayers, but he, a lot of times he says no. You know, <laughs> that is an answer too. We want something and he says, no, I better not have that. Sometimes he gives it to us. The Master says, be careful in the use of prayers. God may give you what you ask for. And if it's not his will and his purpose, it won't be good for you. But you want to test it out, and so you ask him, and you think you're going to do that, and it results in a disaster. He says, look at me, think of the teachings. 
pray for the fulfillment of the divine injunctions and exhortations in your life. The things God is having you pray for, that He reveals prayers so that you say these prayers for, the, for these things that are in the prayers. And that has that transformative dimension for us, especially if we meditate afterwards. Terrific book, Prayers and Meditations by Baha'u'llah, that Shalit Zemi compiled and gave to the Baha'i world back in the 30s. He, uh, for the first time, we have the meditations of Baha'u'llah addressing God about his own condition, his own experience. And he reveals to these that we can see what he went through. I know when I was new Baha'i and I had this prayer book, I was looking for prayers to say, I would find a prayer that would say, Thou seest me locked up in my prison house. I thought, well, that's not for me, and I'd skip to another prayer. It took a long time until I figured out there was some reason he was revealing these meditations so that we could understand the trials and difficulties he was going through. And no matter how difficult our lives are, when we read the lives of the Bab and Ba'ala, there's nothing that we're suffering that can match that. Again, a very encouraging letter from Shavitan. It says, the believers as we all know, should endeavor to set such an example in their personal lives and conduct that others will feel impelled to embrace a faith which reforms human character. However, unfortunately, not everyone achieves easily and rapidly the victory over self. What every believer, new or old, should realize is that the cause has the spiritual power to recreate us if we make the effort to let that power influence us. And the greatest help in this respect is prayer. We must supplicate Baha'u'llah to assist us to overcome the failings in our own characters and also exert our own willpower in mastering ourselves. To use this free will we have to choose what God wants us to choose. And he gives us an opportunity, it seems, every day Moment after moment, we make choices. The way we treat others, the way we act towards situations, all of this is testing us. And so the work is not done until it's done. And he even tells us at the last minute, the all gets spoiled. And even the pious soul sometimes at the end loses its vision and its faith. All the hands of the cause used to the old ones, particularly would say, pray for a good end for me. If you're going to pray, please pray that I have a good end. The middle part, well, I could live with that, but the end, I want to be good. We must supplicate Baha'u'llah to assist us. Do you direct your prayers to Baha'u'llah, or do you direct them to God? Where do we direct our prayers? Where are we supposed to pray to? Generally, in the West, we have a kind of reaction to praying to the manifestation. Solid in the writings, you know? quote some of these things down here from the garden, that we can pray to God, but it's more effectively if, if we pray to God through the manifestation, because he's what God has provided as the means of our attaining to God, whereas God otherwise, if we want to turn to him independent of the manifestation, is an imagination in our minds. We have a God that we've imagined and we worship him. Abu Ha'an says, whoa, whoa, he says, better to worship a stone or a stick than your own imagination of what is God. And anything that's in our imagination that we think is God, that's what God isn't. Tells us that anything that a human can think, that won't be God anymore. So the manifestation is easier to focus on. And even in Shogi Vinny suggests at first, if you don't know how to focus your prayers, look at the photo of Abdul Baha. From that you can conceive perhaps Baha because many people haven't seen or had an opportunity to see this visage of God. And then you avoid these imaginations because there's a reality. It is personally, we know how to address ourselves to a person. But he says, of course, the personality and the outer visage of God is not the thing either. It's the light that's coursing through him. And gradually as we dress ourselves to him, the contact with that light strengthens. And then the question of the personality centered right on the spirit coming out of his words or out of his person if we had the great blessing to him. More effective if you pray through the manifestation. What do we think of when we think of God? We have to be careful because of what he said.
Do we have him off at a great distance somewhere? Do we have him closer to us than our life thing? Questions that we need to, adjustments that we could consider making in the way we pray. Now I've heard it. If you think of God as the sovereign power behind these endless galaxies and planets, infinite number of creatures, after the heart of tablet says there's no way to number the count, the manifestations of God appearing in the universe to the creatures all over the universe. You think this is the only world that has this? God doesn't wait. It's all a waste. It's just so we have a nice night sky up there. We're a fairly ordinary planet. Mr. Olega said when he was with Shoghi Effendi, Shoghi Effendi one day when they were walking in the gardens, he said to him, Abdul Baha said several times, this is the hell of the planets. The most abased planet of all the, in our solar system is this planet. We're probably under quarantine. <laughs> we have visitors coming and going, but they don't get too close and they get sick. Why? Because of materialism. Why? Because Shoghi Fendi then added, because they still kill each other. Is there any lower state of civilization? The great heroes of society are the ones in one country, lead the army to kill thousands, hundreds of thousands in another country, and then you come back and build a statue. Anybody kills their neighbor, we put them in prison. But the armies of the government go away. And he said, look at the spectacle of Christian nations at war with Christian nations in the Second World War. Where is religion gone? It's died out in the world, he said. Surely then he encourages us to pray daily to Baha'u'llah to let you meet a soul receptive to his message. In the morning we ask, Baha'u'llah, help me today to meet somebody who will be receptive to the message. And I, I, I always add something else to that prayer, I say. And give me the good sense to recognize that I can talk to this person about the faith, because sometimes we judge us and they're not going to be interested, or I don't want her in the Baha'i community, or whatever it comes in our head, you know, not going to help. The power of prayer is very great and attracts divine confirmation. Pray to meet receptive, waiting souls. That will move us along much faster than delivering to people who don't seem to have any interest. When should we be praying? All kinds of quotations in the writings about the hours to pray and when to pray. Be set aglow with the fire of the love of God so that the hearts of the people will become enlightened by the light of thy love. Supplicate to God, pray to him and invoke him. This is from the Master. At midnight and at dawn, be humble and submissive to God and chant the verses of thanksgiving at morn and eve for that he guided thee unto the manifest light and show to thee the straight path, and destined to thee the station of nearness in his wonderful kingdom. And another tablet, uh, Abu Baha says, if you prostrate yourself a thousand times a day, it will be insufficient thanks for having been able to guide it and been able to recognize this message. That will become clear in the next world, the distinction. Oh, in prayers and meditations, he says, I have wakened every morning to the light of thy praise and thy remembrance and reached every evening inhaling the fragrances of thy mercy. About this book, when Julian Finney sent it to America, he said he hoped that this volume, above all other volumes, would aid the friends to draw nigh unto Baha'u'llah, that he might draw nigh unto them. The formula is given there. If you don't have that in your library, I urge you to try to get present meditations by Baha'u'llah. Gradually read it, little by little. A hard book to come to grips with this. This is a note by, based on a teaching of the Bab. The note says, His Holiness the Blessed Bab mentions in his book that everyone must consider at the end of each day what have been his actions. If he finds something which would please God, he must thank him and pray to be strengthened to do this good act throughout his life. If his actions have not been approvable or honest, we must earnestly ask God for strength to do better. So this bring yourself to account each night. It's interesting to ask, what have I done that might have been in accord with the good pleasure of God and to thank Him for that? And what have I done that isn't? And to ask Him for forgiveness and strength to do better. Again, from the writing, it says, Reflect, O people, upon the mercy of God and upon His favors. Then thank Him at dawn and at dusk. 
It means two times. When it gets light, when it gets dark, it's time we should be remembering the verses of God and the teachings of the faith. From the Master, one of his accounts after he returned from the West. Prayer and supplication are two wings whereby man soars toward the heavenly mansion of the true one. Usually when you go back to the original of these, the first one is Salah, obligatory prayer. And then there's all the other prayers. There are two categories. So it's translated in English here, prayer and supplication. But uh, for instance, in the Gone, when he says that the sun of the heaven of religion is fasting, and the moon is prayer. The word for prayer there is the one that means obligatory prayer, not all kinds of prayers. Obligatory prayer is the moon of the spiritual religion of God. Prayer and supplication are two wings whereby man soars towards the heavenly mansion of the true one. However, verbal repetition of prayer does not suffice. One must live in a perennial attitude of prayer. When man is spiritually free, his mind becomes the altar and his heart the sanctuary of prayer. Then the meaning of the verse, we will lift up from before his eyes the veil, will become fulfilled in it. Whenever I wanted, the Master again speaking, whenever I wanted to go to the palace of Vashi and meet the blessed perfection, I walked alone and on foot in order to be in an attitude of prayer. In the mosque in Akka for many years, I had a simple room all to myself to which no one had any access. Now and then I would go there and stay one whole day, passing the time in quiet contemplation and prayer. But later on, the affairs of the cause became manifold, and I had to give practically all my time to their dispatch and mansion. Thus, I could no longer enjoy those peaceful hours of spiritual reflection. How I would love to be able to arrange now so that I might go away alone and live in entire seclusion. For this reason, I went to Tiberias, but it was not much of a seclusion. <laughs> Mufti of Tiberias gave the various religious leaders, besides the Muslim, gave them endowments. And they gave the master an apartment. That apartment looks right over, it's right down on the water, looks over the Sea of Galilee. And that was one of the places where Laura, Laura Barney came and took the dictation of the talks of Abu Bakr that became some answer questions. Occasionally after a while, go there, stay a few months, come back to high school, then come back to it. Finally, we have a bit of a, a, a note of warning from, from Baha'u'llah. He says, recite ye the verses of God every morn and eventide. Whoso faileth to recite them hath not been faithful to the covenant of God and his testament. And whoso turneth away from these holy verses in this day is of those who throughout eternity have turned away from God. So we offended. In prayer, the believers can turn their consciousness toward the shrine of Baha'u'llah, provided that in so doing, they have a clear and correct understanding of his station as a manifestation of God. While praying, it would be better to turn one's thoughts to the manifestation as he continues in the other world to be our means of contact with the Almighty. We can, however, pray directly to God himself. You have asked, you have asked whether our prayers go beyond Baha'u'llah. It all depends whether we pray to him directly or through him to God. We may do both, and also can pray directly to God. But our prayers would certainly be more effective and illuminating if they are addressed to him through his manifestation, Baha'u'llah. Friends, that from his initial presentation of the these four steps and the first step prayer. Tomorrow we'll talk about meditation and study. And then we'll go on to action after that. Would you like to finish the time that? If they want to do that, it's all right. Yes, please. Okay, one, two. Yep. Um, firstly, thank you very much for this morning. You mentioned one of the elements of action was sacrificial action. Um, and I wondered if, um, 
a couple of times in discussing with friends the concept of sacrifice, particularly, for example, with, with regard to contribution to the funds and those sorts of things. Abdul Baha talks about notions of your, your industry, your commerce, your agriculture being increased tenfold. And I've had other friends talk to me about the notion that Baha'u'llah will never be in your debt. You know, but of course, yeah, well, sure. if, we, if we are uh, motivated by re the return for our sacrifice, then clearly our sacrifice won't be accepted. But I'm wondering this notion of, um, of, of tenfold increase, of the notion of when we put something out there, when we, the way our efforts are confirmed and, and uh, the way that the, bless the blessings really uh, fall upon us in that process. That this is a, I don't want to describe it in transactional terms, but there, there never, there's a relationship that's formed as a result of that, that sacrifice. I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit. Okay, I think you did a good job. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the basis of it. He says, you know, you give and God gives it back tenfold. Mr. Olinga says, would an employer work his workers endlessly over hours on the weekends and everything and then not pay them? Can you imagine, he said, that God is going to be less just than that? No way. So though we don't work for the reward, the reward is in the action and in the confirmations and breathing the fragrances of God. If we get to that stage where we see the hearts of people changing, then, then that's the reward in itself. If you manage, he says, follow us in the temple, if you are able to transform or be the means of God's transforming of one soul, one single soul in your lifetime, you will attain to the station of a martyr in the world to come. That's how important it is to go out and raise people to spiritual consciousness. Thank you very much for your address this morning. Uh, my question concerned the, um, the training and uh, education and spiritual development of children. The House of Justice, in, in a message a number of years ago, spent some time addressing proper attitude of our community towards children and addressing matters to deal with their development, their spiritual development, their moral development. And I found that this had a profound effect on my own thinking uh, and reflection upon this. It's such a rich two or three paragraphs. It's only a two or three paragraphs in the context of a larger message, but it's so rich and potent. It had a very um, profound effect on my own uh, reflection on this subject. There was one line in there that I would like to ask your thoughts on, and that is there was a line in which it said, so often in the name of building confidence, in children, the ego is inflamed. And so it got me to thinking about how do we develop confidence and their proper development without inflaming the ego, which can be so dangerous to their mm -hmm. development. Uh, and I've pestered everybody about this question, <laughs> so I thought I'd ask you as well if you could share some thoughts on that. So I've been thinking about this and trying to develop my own thoughts on it uh, for some time now. What occurs, one thing that occurs to me, first, we should realize that the House of Justice spend a lot of time compiling Baha'i education, which is one of the compilations. It's in the compilation of compilations, and so you should be able to get to it. And you want to read that. It's a whole, the whole from the Baha'u'llah, the Baha'u'llah, the Baha'u'llah, the Baha'u'llah, the Guardian's letters, all about. So that's the, the main resource. And this letter is mentioning how House supplements that expands on some of those concepts. I know when we were raising our own child, that very, very helpful things. Mr. Fortan was there and others. You never tell the child that it's bad. You say that that action was not appropriate, or doing this, doing this thing or that, that doesn't please God. You know, we should try not to do those things. So, so they separate their reality from their actions in that sense. And in, in, and in a way, that has to do with us with not fanning the ego too much, you know. If we say that when they do good things, that was very good, and we should thank Baha'u'llah, or thank God that we you, you did that, that was very kind, that was very loving, so kind of a way of keeping the sanctity of the individual's reality. But I think, you know, because of worried about ego, we don't, we don't teach them that our mind teaching is because it might make them proud, but it's the opposite result. I think if we look at the teachings, use of the prayers, memorization of the prayers, 
of children, particularly as they're always very keen that children learn prayers and recite them. There's a room now, used to be the Maxwell Library in the house of the master, which has been renovated, and it's now that the, it was the tea room, the breakfast room of the master, where he would sit with the family at, at breakfast time to take tea and hear the recitation of prayers and tablets from the children. Attention. So much can be said on that subject. I've got a lot of parents here. Maybe they're thinking of things they could say and can share them with them after the meeting. Mr. Dabar, I've got a question that relates to your presentation yesterday. You spoke of materialism being the greatest enemy of the faith. Uh, what? Materialism uh -huh. being the greatest uh, enemy of the faith. Yeah. That's a nice word. We, we trot it out with amazing regularity that, um, yes, the world is so material, how do we deal with this? A little bit of preamble here is the other big challenge or some of the other big challenges in the world are, for example, poverty and unemployment. And sometimes they're just too big for us to deal with. One way of humanizing it is looking at it as Poverty is people without financial means. Can you tell me how to humanize materialism and what we can do with that as the highs on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than it being too big to deal with? How can we, as the highs, work with or against materialism to teach the thing? Uh, that's a good subject for everybody to think about, I think. Few thoughts that I would have is that um, we can't really deal with poverty. Uh, our social activities at a local level may be improved for a time, the life of a village or something, but the, the mankind is in the grips of, a, of a catastrophic developments because of having abandoned God and placed false gods, Shelley Finney says, on the altar of our consciousness, such as nationalism, racialism, and communism. These are the what he calls the dark forces, and materialism is high in that list of dark forces, but emphasis on the acquisition of material things on the one hand, the vision of existence as really a product of nature, godless nature on the other hand. So you've got, you've got this atheistic, agnostic element to materialism as well as give me more, give me more, you know, collect things and I'll be happy. My goal is, you know, if I have a Lamborghini, then it's okay, God, I'll be really happy, I promise you. I'll, I'll drive that all over around and go to the study circles and, and my Lamborghini, should be. I think we, we also have to bear in mind, with respect to poverty, how, how we act in our individual lives. I'm hearing Bala saying, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> Are you listening to what advice you're handing out? This is very challenging. He tells us if we see that, if we meet the poor, the impoverished, he says, sit with them and listen to the story of their woes. Nobody listens to them. They don't want to talk to people or down and out, you know? But that's just what they need. Is a little, that's a practical suggestion. That has to do with our own spirituality and the blessing of the, of the poor. He says, when you do that, the Congress is there showering blessings on them, you know. Which is exactly um, the humanizing poverty, making it, bringing it down to if poverty is human beings without material resources. Yeah. So materialism is the opposite. It's human beings with material resources and the desire to achieve more. That's right. So as the highs, how do we um, conquer that? Offering spirituality in, that, in the place of materialism? How do we offer that to the materialistic world? Well, I think spirituality is the opposite of the materialism, basically. And materialism more affects the way we, we view life. I mean, we battle it with the forces of light, with the battle with the forces of love and unity and fellowship, and offering those to people and showing that that has a lot more meaning than collecting material things as far as happiness is concerned. Helping them to kind of adopt a more spiritual point of view as taught by all the prophets of God down to the age.
challenges. But it's very challenging because we face with new problems every day of that sort. We're not going to fix the financial situation of people. We can console them through friendship, love, and fellowship, and share what we have to the degree that we're able to. The master is constantly giving away his pants and his coats and his everything, you know, to the people. Those are quiet about it, but those that have recorded seeing him do these things. They are not supposed to give to beggars. This is in the office. That's professional beggars. That's people that are supposed to organize themselves, or God help us in Central America, they are people. Mothers would maim children to have them there on their laps. And there's a lady my, where my wife lived, impoverished down on the, on the sidewalk there for the years she lived in this apartment house. You know? When she died, they found out she owned four or five apartment houses. And had a lot of wealth, but that was, that was the way she did it. It was a good sound income. So all of us don't encourage that. But at the same time, we don't have society organized in a way where the House of Justice of the government is taking care of those who don't have enough to survive. Though we don't give to beggars, it doesn't mean we can't share with the poor the ones that come into our particular experience. A little tricky with the teaching work because of what the missionaries have done. They hand out all kinds of things. I remember once I was in a remote place in Nicaragua and the talk was whole village of Miskito Indians, and the talk was being translated by someone who had been trained as a missionary, and his moral actions have got him in trouble, he was kicked out, but he was happy to translate for the Baha'is, so that was fine. So I said, are there any questions you want to talk to? And he said, yes, he said, this man, this man has asked, he said, the Protestants, the evangelists, give clothing, and the Catholics give food. What do the Baha'is do? And the translator turned to me and he says, say razor blades, they're very popular. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were faced with this problem of, you know, are you attracting people on a material basis? Which we weren't, we couldn't, and we couldn't sustain that. So I'd be very frank with them, open with them. I'd also try to be as friendly as I could. It's a major question. I hope all of you are reflecting on it. How do we how do we subvert materialism in our own outlook on life, all subtle as it is? There's a few messages under materialism in uh, Citadel of Faith, I'll show you things. I don't know if I've got the page number even here, maybe, where he describes these things. There are two short paragraphs here I'll read, I'll read for you. This is from a message of Shoghi Fendi, July 19th. It happens, it's admitted in the context of him addressing the American believers, but it fits the whole world of my society. The gross materialism that engulfs the entire nation at the present hour, the attachment to worldly things that enshrouds the souls of men, the fears and anxieties that distract their minds, the pleasure and dissipations that fill their time, the prejudice and animosities that darken their outlook, the apathy and lethargy that paralyze their spiritual faculties. These are among the formidable obstacles that stand in the path of every would-be warrior in the service of the faith, in the service of Baha'u'llah. Obstacles which he must battle against and surmount in his crusade for the redemption of his countrymen. To the degree that the home front crusader, that's us, is himself cleansed of these impurities, liberated from these petty preoccupations and gnawing anxieties, delivered from these prejudices and antagonisms, emptied of self and filled by the healing and the sustaining power of God, will he be able to combat the forces arrayed against him, magnetize the souls of those whom he seeks to convert? and win their unreserved, their enthusiastic and enduring allegiance to the faith of the whole. How do we use, how do we defeat materialism? It's really, I think, in these two paragraphs. Do, do we have time? Yeah, very good. <coughs> can you hold it? Yeah, tomorrow? I can wait. Yeah, that's fine. No, it's all right. I'm going to ask you. Oh, it's, I think whether to hold it or not. It's a, <laughs> it's a short question with a short answer. Uh, you mentioned that millions of the uh, words of uh, Baha'u'llah and the Bab have been recorded, uh, digitized. Are those available to the to the public at this no. point? I, short answer, no. Yes. <laughs> the House releases them in new publications from time to time, or as it gives the public. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank you.